Well, good morning. And, uh, oh, what happened to that little deal? Okay. Uh, you know, 61 years ago, I was sitting in a seat over in Irwin Hall. I graduated here in 1962. And I've had kind of an illustrious business career going from an entrepreneur to an entrepreneur to a solopreneur. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. And what I've done through my life is to talk about uh, problems, <coughs> come up with solutions, and the opportunities. And the opportunities are to make money. And there's nothing wrong with making money, believe me. There's my graduation uh, yearbook, picture of myself. I came to Marietta um, on probation. <coughs> I wasn't a very good high school student. But uh, when I got here, I realized that there was no uh, return trip to my basement at my home. I had to get a job. And so I got very involved in, in the college here. And uh, I uh, was a charter member of a fraternity here, TK, TKE, which is no longer on campus. Um, I became the vice president of the freshman class and the junior class. I was the president of the house for a couple of years. And I've got to tell you, being involved while you're on campus and being involved in the community and these things all looks good when you're going out to apply for a job. Getting a 4.0 is great, but you need to do some other things. I think you all know that I'd like to have your attention for the next 50 minutes, so turn off those media devices and what have you if you would. You're not going to find this presentation on Facebook, you're not going to find it on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, these are my real life experiences. I've, uh, over the last 50 years, I've owned 12 different businesses. I've invented four or five different products. We're going to concentrate, let me get this right here, we're going to concentrate on Sears, Hearthcraft, General Fireplace, Skyline Associates, and SkyTech. And these are the, the companies that I have a story that I can tell and I hope it resonates with you. I'm going to walk you through being an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, and a solopreneur. We're going to go through those uh, one by one. Uh, an entrepreneur is a person who goes to work for a large corporation, like Sears Roebuck, which is where I went. And we're going to talk a little bit about that for a second after a question I got yesterday. And so I went to Sears. I took over a responsibility, several responsibilities, and used their money and their reputation and what have you to build a finished product within the corporation, which was uh, very, very successful. And yesterday, somebody brought up uh, a question about Sears Roebuck. And we all know, well, maybe you don't all know, Sears Roebuck went bankrupt this past weekend. Uh, they were sold out for $5.4 billion. And Sears have been around since uh, uh, 1886. They were the largest retailer in the world when I went to work for them. You might say, why would you go to work for Sears? Well, back then, in 1962, they were the largest retailer in the world. And a couple of companies overlapped them almost overnight in the mid-70s. Uh, one of them was Walmart. They started in 1962. <coughs> Their sales last year were $500 billion. Walmart. Today, Americans spend $54.9 million every hour in the Wall store, Wall, uh, Walmart store chain. They have over 11,000 stores. It works out to $32,000 worth of profit every minute. They're bigger than Home Depot, Lowe's, Kroger, Sears, Kmart, Costco, all combined. They employ 2.3 million people. They're the largest company in the history of the world. The question was yesterday about where does Amazon fit in all this? Amazon is an internet company. They don't have, they have store presences. They, they bought uh, uh, Whole Foods and what have you, which is really going to give them distribution centers in addition to the distribution centers that they already have. But uh, Amazon started in 1994. Last year they did $232 billion worth of business, about half the size of Walmart. And it started out in 1994 as a bookstore, an internet bookstore by Jeff Rios, and you're getting a lot of press on him lately over his. Uh, uh, over his lifestyle, let's call it that. Uh, and the third largest retailer, if you can believe it, is Costco. 
They do $138 billion worth of business. Surpassing, surpassing Sears, in, they started in uh, 1983 up in Seattle. So, pretty amazing. So you wonder why I went to work for Sears. They were the largest in the world. And I had a great opportunity within Sears. I was over at Gilman Center. I was holding a meeting there. And uh, in comes a suit from Philadelphia, from Sears. And he was interviewing. And uh, I, uh, my meeting had ended up. And he came in. And we were talking a little bit. And the job market wasn't too good in 1962. And... Uh, he asked me what I was doing. I said, "What I was, I was a senior." And he asked me where I was planning to go. And I said, "Well, you know, I got one job offer, and I was going to go work for Roadway Trucking Company in Cleveland, Ohio, to be a dispatch manager after four years of college." And probably some of you are going to be facing some of those moments that uh, maybe the market isn't quite so good for a job, and you might end up with something a little bit less than what you're studying for, less than what your major is uh, preparing you for. Anyway, he uh, asked me if I'd like to take an interview with Sears. I grew up in a small town of 25,000 people. We had a Sears store maybe, you know, 10 times the size of this room. It had a service station and it had the craftsman tools, it had fishing goods and stuff like that. Way before the internet. But the only connection I had with Sears was that 1,500 page catalog that they would send out twice a year. So I know it was a big company, but I didn't know much about it at all. I passed the interview, they flew me to Philadelphia, where I, where I visited the first large, well, large city and large store. They had a thousand employees in this two-story two uh, building, retail store, and I was just overwhelmed, amazed over what took place. And that was also their territorial headquarters, and so obviously I got a trip through the territorial headquarters. They offered me a job, and I took that job. And I look back on it, and it was probably the best learning experience of my whole life. Um, I spent 13 years with them. Opportunity after opportunity after opportunity across my desk. I, was, uh, I managed two stores. I managed uh, 23. I was managing a very small Sears store in upstate New York. In 24... I took over a test store outside of White Plains, uh, outside of White Plains, New York. It was a test store. I had fixed the first store, done a good job. They said, well, we'll give you this test store and we'll see if you can make that work. And it worked. The next thing, uh, they gave me a desk, a file cabinet, a secretary, and they said, we're going to introduce the radio tire and the diehard battery to the Eastern Territory, and we want you to take the guys from Michelin Tire Company in France and go around and train the salesmen and at the same time open up 45 automotive centers. I didn't know anything about all this stuff. But I said, sure, I'd be glad to do that. So we traveled and we, we trained all these salesmen. We we're selling a $50 tire at that time. Sounds like today it doesn't sound like a big deal. <coughs> and you could buy four really good uh, guardsman tires from Sears for about that same price. So we're trying to sell a $50 tire, one each, for the same price you could buy four. So that was a hard sell, but it worked. It worked so well, corporate from Chicago came out and said, why don't you come to corporate and why don't you become a territorial sales manager for a whole lot of stuff. And so I did. Another great opportunity. And then they asked me to be the buyer of the lighting fixtures, the national buyer for everything that took place in fashion lighting and utility lighting. And they did a pretty good job there. So they said, you did such a good job there. We're going to give you a mess. We're going to give you the fireplace furnishing lines to become a buyer and turn it around. Well, that was an exciting moment. When I went to, the, the, uh, to take over the line, it was sub. It was subperforming as far as sales goes, profits goes, uh, in, uh, and in its industry recognition. Be coming out of the fashion business, fashion lighting, what have you, I looked at this black hole in the wall, the fireplace, and I said, "Gee, putting a frame around that, and glass doors, and what are you? What a great idea!" Sears already had that great idea, but it was a disaster. 
1970, when I took over the line, we sold 10,000 units of glass doors for about $2 million. They had 20, uh, 29 different sizes of glass doors, and they had lots of problems. And this is where we get into this problems, uh, solutions, and opportunity. The problems were 20% of the units that were, that were shipped out came back, and they came back broken, broken glass. Tempered glass is part of a, a glass door fire screen, and if you've seen tempered glass break, it breaks into thousands of pieces, and even returning that glass screen, you might as well throw it in the junk first. So that, that was a problem. The wrong sizes that were ordered by the customer, because there was 29 different selections they could make, that was a problem. It was a two-door system instead of a, a bifold system, so the doors stuck out in the room. That was a safety issue. So what I have to do, I got to figure out how to redesign that, that door frame first, how to redesign it and make it a bifold door, and changing the dimensions of the door would reduce the sizes from 29 to 7. The opportunity was more for Sears than it was for me because I needed to build a new line of energy saving fireplaces, or glass door fire screens. The first problem we had was the breaking of the tempered glass. I got the supplier of the glass, Pittsburgh Plate Glass, together with the supplier of the fire screen, and we sat in a restaurant, and we were talking about how do we solve this problem. And the supplier said, well, you know, I've already solved that problem. I put this gusset in the corner. And the Pittsburgh guy says, well, wait a minute. We're shipping you 90-degree corner glasses. So when that glass hits that corner, it implodes. So on the back of a napkin, we said, well, we're going to make it a right angle. And Pittsburgh says, well, why don't I radius that corner? Problem solved. That simple. Next thing, how do we go from this narrow framework to something bigger? Well, we increase the widths and the depths of all the screens. How do we solve the safety problem? Why don't we make it a bifold, like a closet door? Instead of having the, just the door open like that, let's make it a bifold door. Well, that was pretty successful. From 1970 to 1974, we sold 406. You know, excuse me. In 1974, we sold 416,000 doors instead of 10,000. The sales went from two million to 46 million dollars. We went to just seven sizes uh, from. Uh, 29 different sizes. Pretty successful, pretty successful. So I had an aha moment. I figured I'm going to go in and I'm going to get my bonus and I'm going to get a big bonus. When I went in to get my bonus, which was 25% of my salary, the boss said, we're only going to cut your bonus 19% this year. And I said, what? Why would you do that? Increased sales, increased profits, increased overbillings, and what have you. Well, you know, we own all state insurance company, and all state insurance company suffered some uh, uh, hurricanes on the Gulf Coast, and we thought everybody should suffer. And my response was, <coughs> when they were making a lot of money, I never got a bump in my bonus, so why should I take a hit in my bonus? Well, it prompted a career change, and I became an entrepreneur. I'd been setting up suppliers all over the country. I had traveled around the world. Uh, most of it came a little bit later, but I did travel around the world for Sears on a few, few uh, issues. And so I decided to become a, an entrepreneur. And that's a person that basically starts a company, takes over a company, reorganizes a company. And so I had this opportunity to go to Portland, Oregon to take over a $2 million company. Remember, I'm going from one item, $46 million, to a $2 million company, and that was the whole thing. They were a company I was negotiating with to supply glass door fire screens before I left. Uh, but when I did leave Sears, I left on very good terms. I gave them the two weeks notice. I was very nice, and I knew at some point in time I was going to come back and knock on their door and try to sell them glass door fire screens with this company wasn't making yet. So I took over Hearthcraft. Uh, I built it from $2 million 
to $20 million. And guess who my biggest customer was? Sears Roebuck and Company. Ten and a half million dollar contract I got with them to supply glass door fire screens. And of course I built a whole lot of other things going on for the regular the retail market other than the Sears business. Well, I got real cocky and I thought, well, there's a lot of people trying to get in the glass door fire screen business because it became knowledgeable that it was a energy saving device. Back then we were in the middle of the OPEC energy crisis and everybody was trying to turn down their thermostats, save energy and what have you. And there were some people that joined the marketplace that were building junk. And I said, well, I think what I'll do is I'll buy out the biggest competitor. That was a mistake because when I went to buy this $55 million company, the management, the accountants, the bankers, the attorneys all looked at Hearthcraft and said, we're a lot bigger than you are. So they bought me out on the spot. I had to go to work for a company again. I didn't like that. But anyway, I bought a couple of companies for them. I set up a company called Gen uh, uh, General Fireplace. I was the president of that. But I had to, I had to respond to all these people that wanted to uh, tell me how to run my business. And I was pretty good at running my business without their help. That didn't last very long. So about six months later, I decided to depart. Um, and I decided that maybe it's time that I became a solopreneur. And that's a person that decides to develop their own brand. And I've been branding uh, for other people and I decided to do my own brand. I knew I had the capability of developing products. I had sourcing uh, connections all over the world that I could use. And so, I decided to go alone. I used to have over 2,300 people working for me, and I ended up having one employee, and that was me. I ran this ad in the Portland, Oregon paper, and I formed a company called Skyline Associates. And people say, what's Skyline Associates, and what are, who are the associates? And I said, well, that's the street I lived on, Skyline. And me, myself, and I are the associates. Still one person, but we can call it associates. So I created a business card. I put this ad in the paper and ended up being contacted by these two companies. They wanted me to be a contract marketing manager for them. One, they both were in the fireplace industry. This company manufactured fire screen mesh. This one uh, supplied uh, stainless steel for the chimney systems. I formed another company with some guys in China, which is uh, not what we're going to talk about. And, uh, and it basically it says, Portland businessman with 13 years of experience, it's going overseas, I'll be, I'll be able to act as your representative, doing contract man uh, manufacturing or product sourcing, research, whatever you want done. And I got not only these connections, but I got a couple of other ones. I started out when I was with Sears, I did business in Japan, I did business in Korea. So I continued to contact Korea, Korea, then Taiwan, Hong Kong, and then I started working my way up into China when China uh, was coming on board. I was went to China, my first trip was in 1985, it was before they really had the manufacturing facilities that they have today, and they're as competitors as they are. People ask, well, how did you... How did you develop your relationships with these customers? And I said, well, first of all, I listened to their problems. And I developed this problem-solution mentality. And I wasn't necessarily trying to build a product for them across the pond and bring it over here. I went after what I call the niche business. I was trying to find components, something small enough that a large company didn't want to get involved in, but large enough to make, make some money for myself. So you create your opportunities by having conversations and listening. Uh, I guess that's part of communication too, isn't it? Um, I used existing technologies when I could. I, I repurposed existing products. And the interesting thing happened, and these are the three things we're going to talk about a little bit. Lava rock, door handles, and cam locks. 
none of them are products in themselves that you want to go out on the street or you know you go out to the marketplace and buy. When I was in Taiwan, I was talking to uh, one of my suppliers, and uh, he said, "What do you know about lava rock?" And I said, "I don't know a whole lot about lava rock. Why do you ask?" And he said, "Well, he said uh, I supply I'm, I supply six different manufacturers of barbecue grills." And we're not happy with our supply chain. Uh, the, the product isn't coming in on time. It isn't the right size. A whole lot of a whole lot of problems he shared with me. But he says, "How come you don't know anything about lava rock?" And he said, "You live in Washington State. Mount St. Helens blew up. There must be rock all over the place." And I said, "Well, that's not the way lava rock is formed. It takes 50 to 60 million years for lava rock to be formed." And uh, so I know there are deposits in Oregon and Washington and Idaho, uh, but I don't know too much about it. So give me some samples. So they gave me some samples of lava rock. And years ago, you don't do it anymore, years ago you used to get an eight pound bag of lava rock with your, uh, with your barbecue grill. And you put it in there along with it, next to the grate and, and on the grate. But if the size wasn't right, the grates weren't right, and the size of the rock wasn't right, it would fall down on the burner and choke out the gas burning. So that was a problem. Rock sizing. They were shipping red rock when all the suppliers wanted black rock. It just depend on where you, where you mine it, what vein it's in. We had pricing issues. They were shipping wet rock instead of dry rock. So I, I knew a little bit about screens and sorting and what have you, and so I ended up going over to uh, Eastern Washington and, and Eastern Idaho, uh, or Western Idaho, and I asked him, how do I get these three different sizes of rock consistent? And he says, you've got to buy these screens. And I said, well, how much are the screens? And he said, well, he said, we'll sell them to you for about $900 each, and we'll crush the rock, and they've had three different things. How are you going to pick it up? Are you going to bring in your dump trucks? Or what? I said, no, no, I'm going to export this rock. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to put it in a, in a cardboard carton. And he said, where are you going to get the carton? Because we don't do that. We ship all our rock out <coughs> in 12-yard dump trucks. So I went over to Boise Cast. Okay, was that me? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so I went, to, uh, I went to Boise Cascade, who manufactures cartons. And they manufactured cartons for refrigerators, for washers and dryers and what have you. And that's about the size I needed, something about the size of a washing machine or dryer. And I said, do you have any, uh, uh, I asked him what the price would be, and he told me it was about 20 bucks. And I said, it's more than I really want to pay. Do you have any reject cartons? Cartons that are misprinted, they're, uh, they're, they're made incorrectly. And he says, yeah, we get those all the time. We just recycle them. I said, well, if you didn't recycle them, what would you sell them to me for? And he said, eight dollars. I said, well, I think I can live with eight bucks. The next thing I need to do is I need to put it on a pallet. I didn't want to pay eight, nine dollars for a brand new wooden pallet. So I went to the pallet manufacturer and I said, how about some pallets that you really can't reconstruct, you can't rebuild? It's a one-way trip pallet. He said, yeah, we have those. And I said, how much for those? Four dollars. I can, I can live with four dollars. So now I've got I've got the quarry, I've got the screens, I've got the rock, I've got the box, I've got the pallets. i got to move them. So I had to engage several trucking companies to move 65,000 pounds of rock on one trip to go into, because that's what I could put into a container, to the Port of Portland. And I hired a container stuffing company. So we stuffed containers, and we put them on a ship, and we shipped them off. A lot of work, but once the work's done, you just keep getting orders. So I shipped 250 high cube containers of lava rock to Taiwan, Hong Kong, Australia, and China, and I made some money. I shipped 16,000, 16 million pounds, excuse me, of rock. My rock cost me 36 bucks, my pallet was four bucks, my carton was eight. Transportation is high back then, and the stuffing cost me that much. So my out-of-pocket cost was $71. They were paying $155 per, 
per metric ton from their current supplier. So I figured I just want to be under 150. So I priced it at 148. So I made a gross profit of $77 times 8,125 uh, metric tons, and I made $625,000 exporting rock. Rock. Let's think about it. The next opportunity that came up is fireplace handles for fireplace glass screens. Now, recall, I'm in the fireplace industry for many, many years, had my own businesses and what have you. But we all happened to, to go to the same trade show, the uh, hearth, barbecue, and patio uh, lines were all in one trade show each year. So here I am back at that same trade show, but no longer a competitor in glass door fire screens. <coughs> I'm selling lava rock. Lots of people came to me, and I knew everybody in the industry because I've been in everybody plant as the as the uh, Sears buyer, uh, and I knew knew everybody in the industry. They all knew me, and they said, well, "Where did you get all those handles that you used to supply for Sears? You used to supply for all your other customers and what have you?" And I said, "Well, I have a lot of sources overseas that uh, I, I can rely on." He said, "Well, would you like to make handles for us?" And these are some of the you know, different glass door fire screen companies, zero clearance companies, and what have you. And I said, well, yeah, I can do that. Why? Well, you know, UL just adapted a whole new standard on handles. And instead of having zinc handles, we had to have handles that had wood in between them. And none of our suppliers want to make it. They don't want to invest in the tooling. This is just a small collection of some of the handles that I developed for these various customers all had wood in the middle so when you're opening that glass door the uh, the heat on the wood is a lot less the heat transfer is a lot less than it would be on a metal handle or a zinc handle so i developed not only the line of handles but as long as i was at it why don't i just develop a line of zinc handles uh to just take all that handle business and then I offered for some companies that didn't want to have a four inch center to center, they wanted to have a five inch or six inch and what have you, I'll tell you what, you pay for the tooling, I will get the handles made for you. So I became a hero. I became the person who they would go to for skyline handles. How many handles did I sell? Oh my gosh, 1.75 million handles in a period of time that I was in that business. How much money did I make? I did well. I bought them for about 48 cents. I sold them for about 88 cents times 1.75 million. Now I made $708,000. I'm building my bank. I'm building my bank for my big hit down the road that I know I needed some money for. The next one was cam locks. There's a company called Petalator, which was the largest manufacturer of zero clearance fireplaces in the country. And I was obviously selling them mesh, I'm selling them handles, and I'm down there at uh, Bob Burns uh, factory and he said, I got a problem, my, my counterpart has a problem. Hitler was owned by uh, Han Industries and they were the second largest manufacturer of file cabinets and office equipment in the world. And they decided, Han decided, that they wanted to attract the market for low-end file cabinets, home office file cabinets, uh, and they formed, they developed a new company called XLM. And he said, that president's having a lot of problem at corporate when he goes up there, they're not making enough money, and you know, maybe you could talk to them. I said, okay. So I went over and talked to, to Jeff, and I said, uh, what's your biggest problem? He says, my biggest problem is my cost. And my biggest cost item is a lock that I have to put on this $11 uh, file cabinet. So they're shipping a file cabinet, two drawer file cabinet for 11 bucks and they gotta pay a dollar for a lock that is useless because the framework on the door is like this. So if you really want to pull the handle, you could reach in and get what you want out of it. I said, why do you do that, Jeff? He said, well, because my competition does it and I have to have this lock but I have to pay almost a dollar for that lock. And I said, well, that was one of the problems. 
And uh, he said, I got problems with labor. I mean, to put this lock on, we have to, the line worker has to, uh, what's going on here? No. They have to uh, put this in, in the in the hole. Oh, this is not going in there very well. Hmm. Maybe in moving it around here. One hey, there we go. And uh, then they have to push this clamp in there. Now you saw how much they do a lot faster than I just did, but uh, there's a clip that's a little bit out out of uh, alignment here. So I said, well. Suppose I develop a plastic lock for you. Suppose I develop a lock that has a living hinge in it. Oh, it was, you can't use plastic. I said, why not? He says, because corporates taste, tested the plastic locks. They don't pass the test. I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Because I'm, I'm, I know about high impact plastic, ABS plastic. I've been building handles with it. I've been building other products. Why don't I pay for the tooling for a brand new lock. You give me all the specifications. And once I get it perfected, I'm going to send you 200 samples. All this at my cost. And if it works, if this plastic lock works, the only thing I'm going to ask for you is to have an exclusive contract for all your hand locks. Now, they were building 11 to 12,000 file cabinets a day. The math in my head went like this. That's a lot of locks. And I figured if I could invest 5,500 bucks in some tooling, and I could convert that into a profitable product component, uh, I'd be doing well. So I did. This is, a, this is the front I'm going to go to the next slide. There we go. This is the two drawer file cabinet right here. This is the, the this is the drawer front that they gave me with all the holes punched in so I could have the supplier test the tool parts. And what I did was develop a lock. See how good it is? Let's try another one. <laughs> this is a lock. You put it in the hole. That's it. No clip, no clamp, nothing. It held itself. Just as you just saw there, I sold seven and a half million locks. I bought him for about 33, sold him for about 47, yeah. half of what he was paying. The profit was 14 cents, doesn't sound like a lot, but times seven and a half million, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Well, I had another aha moment. Again, I'm back down at Heatalator, now I'm at the same factory where XLM is and what have you. And Bob Burns, a good friend of mine, was the president of Heatalator. And he said, you know, the industry has changed a lot since you were here. You know, it used to be all wood burning, but now it's gas fireplaces. And the way we operate our gas fireplaces is with a wall switch. You turn it on and off with a wall switch. Is there any way you can figure out how to remote control that? I said, gee, I don't know, Bob, why don't you send me a couple samples and I'll play around with it. I didn't know anything about remote controls. But he had a great idea, and I needed to figure out how to turn that into a money-making experience for myself. And I went to a, a trade show in Chicago, which I, uh, I, I didn't pull them out here, but I would go to a trade show about every other month, get to free chase trade shows, and you, you have them all around here in Miami. Just to learn about what was going on in the marketplace. And I came across Chamberlain Garage Doors. And they were the first maker of a remote control control garage door opener. And they had what they called a clicker. And they were using uh, radio frequency technology versus infrared technology. And the difference is infrared technology is a signaling system 
that relies on light to turn on your VCR, your TV, your cable system. <coughs> The radio frequency is a radio frequency that's set out. It's your telephones, uh, your cell phones and everything operate on radio frequency. The problem with infrared is that fire is infrared. So you get false activation of the fireplace. So I had to be dealing with radio frequency. And I walked up to the salesman at the booth and I told him I had this idea. I had been to Radio Shack and I bought parts and pieces and I was messing around. I just didn't have it. I didn't have the brains to do it. I didn't have the technology to do it. I needed somebody to help me do this. And I asked them if they'd help me. And the salesman said, well, how many are you going to buy? And I said, well, I don't know, you know, maybe four or 5,000. He said, oh my gosh, we're not talking 40 to 50,000 pieces. Uh, we're not interested. And about the same time, one of their vice presidents comes by, and he'd heard this whole conversation, and he said, that's really interesting. He says, you know, but we're not in the remote control business. We're in the garage door opener business. And just think about that. Here's a, here's a suit, an executive vice president. We're not in the remote control business. Yet, without the remote control, they didn't have a controller for their garage door opener. So he said, we just bought a company down in California. And he gave us what they call the rolling codes. Every time you push the button, the code would change. So you wouldn't have that same code opening uh, and that same frequency. And he has an open fee clause. And I'll give you his name and his phone number. And if you want to contact him, I don't think we'd have any problem with him developing that for you. So I got back to Portland. I called the guy up. Got on a plane, went down to see him, spent a Saturday afternoon with him. He said, I can do that. I can do that. And uh, so we entered into a contract. He said, I want 8800 bucks, And I want 44 now. I want 44 in 30 days when I send you some samples. And I said, sounds good. Sounds good. 30 days later, I got two samples. And I tested them, and they worked, and they worked. I got on a plane, I went across the pond to Hong Kong first, and then I dropped over to, and I went up to uh, <coughs> Taiwan, found a supplier, made the first unit. These were some prototypes that I made, just the little handles and what have you. But I needed to have it, a, uh, I needed to have a device that wasn't hooked up to any electric. So I developed a battery operated system that was just operate just from batteries that were on the receiver and the transmitter. These are some of my first handmade prototypes that I put together. Uh, I developed a brand name called SkyTech instead of Skyline. Well, that sounded a little sexier to me at that time. Then I built a display. And guess where I'm at? I'm right back at that same trade show that I was at selling glass door fire screens selling lava rock, selling handles, and now I'm selling remote controls for those fireplaces. I had 16 different remote systems. These were transparencies with a light bulb behind them. I had, I had a display with 16 different remote controls, and anybody could walk up, pick up that remote, push a button, and it would only turn on one transparency or one light at the time. And that's important because if you got a remote control, a radio frequency remote control system, where it's not a point and shoot, you've got to worry about the house next door, the house upstairs, in your apartment buildings, condo buildings, you don't want to be falsely activating somebody else's fireplace. It was very, very successful. The demand was outstanding. So I built this company called SkyTech. This was one of the catalogs uh, that I had. And by the time I sold the business, I had developed 25 different remote control systems for every gas log and every fireplace in the United States, Canada, and Western Europe. And when I go to visit a customer, potential customer, I had already made a silk screen with all their names on it. So let's just say Manesson is a fireplace company. I'd go in and I'd have their name screen printed on a half a dozen samples. And they would think, oh, this is just ours. Well, it's not really, because I told them 
Uh, somebody else's name might be on that, but it might be the same design. I ended up starting out with a two-button remote to the sexiest remote there was. It had nine buttons, it had actually ten buttons, different modes, and one it had an LCD screen. It would turn your fireplace on and off uh, manually or thermally, so you could set a thermostat in this. You could also change the speed of the fan on the fireplace, three different speeds. You could change the, the uh, flame height, all with one remote. Pretty sexy. And I started out, this is a dollar remote control that I bought. It operates TV, it's an infrared. And that's where I got my idea of designing the case. So I went down to a dollar store and that's where I bought it. That was a lot of fun. Now, people ask me, well, how did you, and this came up at a yesterday's session, how did it feel being a solopreneur? Going from a company like as big as Sears down to a little, comp little smaller company, what have you, and then just to have yourself in your own little office. And I said, well, you know what? It was very lonesome because you end up doing everything yourself, everything as a solopreneur. But I learned the art of subcontracting. I remember I was with Sears. They had 350,000 employees at that time. When I owned Hearthcraft, I had 520 employees. And when I had General Fireplace, I had 2,300. And now it's just me. I learned to subcontract all the services that used to be in-house. They call that overhead, your cost. I knew what my cost of everything was because it was on a contract basis. So my, so my designers and liars, I knew what my costs were in transportation, which is a big piece of any kind of a retailing operation, a retail product, all my advertising graphics, and my sales organization was commissioned. If they didn't sell anything, they didn't earn anything. I paid them 10%. So I had 240 sales uh, representatives. Uh, they were working out of big groups. And if they got an order, they got, they got paid the commission. They didn't. I didn't have to pay them. They weren't my contract. They were my contract employees. This was my office. I built 10,000 square foot, off, or excuse me, 1,000 square foot addition onto my home. Uh, look and be professional. Very, very important. You know, uh, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So when people would come to see me, uh, this was my desk. This was my uh, file cabinet system and what have you. And these are what I call project boxes. And I noticed this yesterday at a presentation. They had project boxes for their making uh, 3D machines over in uh, Ricky Lab, right? Yeah. And every customer had a project box. So their product, our correspondence, prototypes, everything else would be in that box. And when they would call up, I would go pull that box, put it on my desk, and we'd have a conversation. And it was like, how does he know all this stuff? And it's all right in front of me. Communication again. This is my test lab. So, here's, a, here's two things that are probably most important and why I'm as successful as I have now. Ethics and integrity. Two most important things you can think about. And there's no such thing as a minor lapse in integrity. Think about where I was in this uh, fireplace, barbecue, patio furniture um, uh, trade show. I knew everybody, they knew me, and I would end up going to their factories. I would be talking to their engineers. I would be talking to their marketing people, and I knew all their plans. What do you think would happen if I decided I wanted to share that plan with somebody to get their order? I'd be knocked right out of the box. So confidentiality and integrity and ethics are the most important thing in business. Don't ever sell yourself short. I had one last, I'm doing good on the time here, I say, I don't add one last moment. Uh, again, I'm back at the fireplace trade show. And a whole lot of people during that period of time when I was developing remote controls, a lot of people got into that same business. I didn't patent anything. 
people ask me, why didn't you patent anything? And I said, well, patenting is a long procedure and expensive procedure. It takes you two to three years to get a patent. You might spend ten to fifteen to twenty thousand dollars getting a patent with the attorneys. You got to work with the U.S. Uh, the uh, United States Patent and Trademark Office and what have you. And that's a government agency. And so instead of patenting anything, I went all these different uh, remotes that I bought. I made a better mousetrap every year. So when people would go to this trade show, they'd want to come over to the SkyTech booth. What have you done this year new? Well, I've added four more buttons, or I added a screen, or I added this, and I added that. So I just kept making a better mousetrap, and everybody was behind me until I decided to re-enter the marketplace and build a product called the Remote Envy. It had both infrared and radio frequency in it, so it could operate your fireplace, your TV, your DVD, your VCR, your cable system, whatever the case may be. Put out a, a public relations that I'm coming back to the market. I was the father of remotes, so I'm coming back with this product. And here's some of the prototypes. So I tested it at this trade show, and one of the largest competitors, I guess we'll call them, in the remote business came up to me and he said, if you bring this thing to market, you're going to kill my business. I said, now there's lots of room, there's lots of, lots of people in the business, I'm not going to kill your business. He says, but you got everything, everything in all one remote. I said, yeah. And he said, uh, would you sell that idea to me? And I just kind of laughed and I said, sure. He said, well, how much do would you want? And I said, well, how about a million bucks? He kind of looked at me and he said, I need some time to think that one over. And I said, well, I understand. Um, while you're thinking it over, I'm going to start charging interest on your thoughts. And uh, 30 days later, he came back, wrote me a check for a million dollars plus interest. The product never went to market. It got buried. And that happens often with uh, inventors, inventions and what have you. But it was a fun trip, and I retired one more time. And what I had done, I, I disrupted the whole industry. It's called a disruptive technology, and that's happening every day. Yeah, you see it everything from, from Netflix to the self-driving cars. This is all disruptive technology that's occurring. And I guess the real question you have to ask yourself is you listen to all this, and if you have some interest in maybe following my footsteps, not, not, not right behind me, but do you have, you know, do you have the DNA to think outside the box, which is what I've done all my life, think out the box. I, I didn't have that technical background. I didn't grow up with that technical background. You people have been, you know, so fortunate to be exposed to the technology of the internet and the communications that, that's available to you. And just this morning, this these numbers that I got today, I just went on the internet and got them. Uh, and, and I, uh, it's just amazing what you have at your fingertips. And if you can think outside the box and think about doing something, building something, um, uh, it's it's not something that just comes naturally to some people. And some people it comes naturally if they question themselves a little bit about, gee, I think I could do that. And maybe listen to me sell a box of rocks or a handle or a, a remote control might just stimulate your thinking. And I'm hoping that's what this conversation is all about today.